awesome, awesome, awesome. Amen. Can you all hear me good? Do praise the Lord. So Joshua, how do I sound there on the live feed? I sound good. God is good. Praise the Lord. Excellent, excellent. Oh, yes. Um, so thank, thankful to God for these guys. I appreciate you very greatly. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. God is good. And, um, woo! Yes, Lord. Whoa, hallelujah. God is good. I am so excited and so fired up. Today, we will get started with the book of Isaiah. Um, I want to remind us of a couple of things. I want you to think about this meeting tonight as a time of remembrance. Imagine that we're getting ready for an examination. We've had lectures, we've had teachings, we've had, we've had sermons, and we're getting ready for a test. And the professor is kind enough to dedicate a particular class, almost all of it, or at least a good part of it, uh, to going over the things that have been said so that we are duly reminded. You know, I just want to say, you know, Christian, you know, you just don't know the extent to which some of the little tweaks you make blesses lives. You know, there are people that are a little hard of hearing and they want to listen to the messages and sometimes just like a little hissing sound, you know, will get in the way, especially at the beginning. And one day I brought it up and I don't know what you did, but whatever you did, has been working. The feedback's been phenomenal. Thank God for you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so today we will go over a couple of things because of the fact that that is the time that we're in. Uh, and just to be very sure, not like I had any doubt, but just for my own sake and for yours, the Lord said to me, ask Rosemary to go and pray. So I asked my wife to come and pray. She wasn't planning on it, you know. She was trying to decide whether to put her shoes back on or to just go anyway. I mean, it's like, what is going on here? Why do you keep doing things like this? Well, if we don't do things like that, how would you know that we are led by the Holy Spirit? Isn't that awesome? And I've got a good friend of mine here today. We met about a week ago but he's become a good friend of mine because you know, when you meet someone by God's connection, you can only, you can be confident that it's a good friendship. Praise the Lord. My friend Andre, good to see you here. Yeah, God is good. You know, we met just about a week ago in what could have been a coincidence, but you know, it was divinely orchestrated. And he said to me, he says, I can tell you, you have over 200 videos on your YouTube channel. I'm like, absolutely. That means you've been there. He says, oh, I've been there. He says, this is a new venue. I said, wow, you can tell that too. He said, how would I know if I haven't been? And so it's just amazing that, you know, some people that we have known for longer have not even come to appreciate or enjoy what God has put us here to do as much as he has. So God bless you. It's a joy to have you here today. Do you know that? Do you remember? I should say toward the end of, okay, alrighty, praise the Lord. Now, let us do this. We're going to pray for seven things real quick because the Lord said to me to set it into motion. What I saw as the Lord was delivering that message to me was I saw a place on the one side and a destination on the other side. And he said to me, he says, I've got a vessel that will take you. He said, but I need other vessels to be on the water so that when you get over to the other side, no one is left behind. You know, there are times where in, from Jesus' ministry, we had an example of what it means for a people to be in the same company, but to be operating on different times and at different frequencies. You know, Jesus was operating on the timing of heaven and he was operating also in the frequency of the Father. Even though the disciples were next to him, John would put his head on Jesus' shoulders and yet they weren't pressing in. And so from there, we learn that it is important and expedient for us to lean on the Holy Spirit to allow for every one of us to move with the cloud of God's glory. Because the Bible says it is the Holy Spirit that sheds abroad our hearts, the love of God that constrains us. So if we are together like this without the Holy Spirit, there's no way we can really move in one accord. And so I say all of that to say that these prayers that we're saying is to enable each and every one of us in here to be able to ride to the the other side and for us to get there together let me give you an example Jesus told his disciples let us go to the other side but because Jesus being the word of God he knows the power of what comes out of his mouth so when he said let us go to the other side he was already on the other side so all of what happens between point A and B was no longer Jesus' concern because Jesus was already at, dest at the destination. But the disciples were lagging behind and that was why they could see the wind, they could feel the storm, and they could experience all of that trouble simply because they weren't where Jesus was. 
Jesus was asleep, he was at rest, but they were being troubled. And so it is possible for us to be moving in the same vessel, but yet at different times in the vessel. So let's say, for example, Jesus said, let us go to the other side at 5.45 p.m. And it would take two hours for them to get there. So 7.45, they would have already been on the other side. 8 p.m., Jesus would have fallen asleep on the other side. But the disciples were still at 6.45, an hour into the trip, in the middle of the sea, and they were super troubled. So I want, I'm doing something here, so bear with me, because there is the need for us to grow and there is a need for us to have more of what heaven does in the background exposed to us okay so what is going on right now is one of those background activities that happens so that we can move together as one unit and one team so what's going on in the background right now is that we are being synced up you know our time is being synced up so that what things i'm saying to you will arrive at the same time as it is in my heart in your own heart. You see what I mean? And so there's a sinking up going on. I, I knew the Holy Spirit was up to something. I wasn't sure what it was until now. When we got into the car for the first time, I was surprised that my wife's clock and my clock were saying the same thing. I was genuinely surprised. You know that I said, that I was like, wow, your clock and mine, they're saying the same thing. And then I caught myself back and I said, wait a minute. This is something that I used to do as a profession. These are network services. There is a network server somewhere on T-Mobile that makes sure that every phone that is connected to T-Mobile is saying the same time, even to the microsecond. So why was I surprised? And so that was puzzling to me. I'm like, did I forget technology and how it works? Why was I now surprised that the time has been synced up? And now the Holy Spirit is letting me know that he drew my attention to it because of what he wants to do in here tonight. You understand what I mean? I've always known that my wife's time and mine on our phones, they have to say the same thing. If they don't say the same thing, the world is in trouble. Because almost everything that you enjoy as far as technology is concerned that is connected to the internet needs to have a time server that it connects to. Otherwise, Brother Matthew can send you an email on Wednesday and you get it on Monday. You see what I mean? You can get a future email in the past if the times are not synced up correctly. And then you can get a, an email sent today, not delivered to you for another month because your clock is not correct. The other day, Brother Greg, I'm not throwing shade here, but I'm just gonna say this. Brother Brad got out, Greg got out the camera. He started taking pictures without changing the time on the camera. Because the camera is not like a phone, it's an actual camera. In case some of y'all don't know, less, the youth are no longer in the room, right? There's something called a camera that is not on your phone. Yeah. So he got a natural camera that was not synced up to the internet. And he took a bunch of pictures. And when we got home, we couldn't find them. I was like, was he just flashing in our faces like our uncles used to do? You know those uncles back in the day when you have family functions, they're out of film or they're trying to conserve their film for the actual celebrant and so whenever the kids come uncle uncle take pictures take pictures they just blow the flash in your face so you're like yes and you never see those pictures maybe when you get to heaven one day you'll see it so i was like was he just blowing flashes in our faces and then we looked and looked i was like joshua where are the pictures i just downloaded everything that's on the camera and you know what i was like okay it is what it is we lost an entire event no photos Maybe two, three days later, we were looking for an old picture. So I went back to like 2017. And guess what? All those pictures were there. I'm like, well done, Mr. Time Traveler, Brother Greg. You see what happens? He did what he was supposed to do in terms of providing a service. But the time of his device was out of step with the time of the computer. And so when the computer received those picture files and he saw they were dated 2017, he put them where they're supposed to be in 2017. And this is what happens to a lot of us. We have been spoken to by the Holy Spirit. We have been prophesied over. However, our internal clock system is out of sync with what God is doing. And that is the reason why the enemy is able to bring your heart frustration at what the Lord said because you thought what was prophesied over you on Tuesday should have happened by now. 
And the reason why that happens sometimes is not even just because of you. It could also be because of the prophet or the man of God who said in a few days, this will happen. I prophesied over people before when I would say to them, in a few days, this will happen. Simply because I wasn't conscious of where I was when I saw what I saw. So there are times when the Lord's taking me into the future and I'm looking at the event and I'm like, this thing is about to happen. Whereas I'm not conscious that I'm two years away from where the person who needs the miracle was standing. And then the person is like, oh, this man of God. I don't know where he got that from. He probably just downloaded that prophecy from the internet. Because a few days have come and gone. It's even been a few months and I haven't seen the prophecy. But when the time comes and it happens, God would leave indicators there. Time stamps that let you know that of a truth, this is that word of the Lord. And it's not coming to fruition. Somebody called me from the UK in October of 2020 and he prophesied over me. He said things that I had just put before God, my wife and I. And pretty much everything that we had put before God, he was just prophesying like a, like a gun. He just kept firing. I was beyond excited. I was super pumped. 2020 was over, nothing happened. 2021, nothing happened. Those things were not fulfilled until summer of 2022. But when they started happening in summer of 2022, it was literally as though I could hear the man's voice again. Apparently, the dude was in 2022. So you know what happened? After like two or three of those things got fulfilled, I called him. I said, man of God. I said, remember this day that you called me? He barely remembered. So I tried to remind him. You know when someone is trying to remind you of something forcefully? So eventually he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember, I remember. I'm like, is that that he remembers or was just tired of me trying to remind him? And then I told him and he was like, ah. Oh. He says, this is good. Thank you for telling me that. He said, because so many people around me now are mad at me. He says, I'm so alone, no friends. Everyone's just picking at me. I said to him, I said, this is probably why they're picking on you and angry with you because a lot of what you're saying doesn't match what they're hearing because of the fact that you are not where they are. I believe that I've given you enough reasons to allow the angels of the Lord to work on resetting the clock of your hearts so that you are hearing what God is saying now. So that the things that you have heard in the past that you did not file correctly, like the photos of Brother Greg, you can now recalibrate them so you're putting things in perspective. You see, because God is in eternity and every word of God is forever settled in heaven, which means God's word is not particularly calibrated according to the timing of man, but God has given you something called faith. And by faith, you can align the fulfillment of that word with the time that you are in. I tell you, there is stuff that God wants to do for you that you have not yet developed the faith to receive. Neither have you come to the maturity to enjoy that thing and it's been delayed. But if there is an emergency, do you know that it is possible for you to time travel by faith to a future version of yourself that is able to accommodate and to receive that which the Lord has for you? I said that to you about a month ago and it's still very true because that is the way things operate in the realm of the spirit. So here we are. You know, many of us, it's not that God did not call us. No, he did call you. It's not that you were imagining the things that you saw concerning yourself, your family, and your business. No, he did show those things to you. But you just did not apply your heart to knowing the time of the fulfillment of those things. Let me tell you something about Joseph. Remember that Joseph, he saw that at some point his brothers would bow and his mother and, f and that his parents too will bow. And the guy was like, wow, I'm a big boy. His father was buying into that, you know, same narrative. His father was like, well, because the Bible says he told it to his father as well. And when the father heard that this is the prince, that this is the son that will carry that mantle of promise, he was so excited, he made him a coat of many colors to distinguish him from his brethren. He was trying to help the fulfillment of God's prophecy because they thought that was the time. His brothers will go out to the field to work and the father will say to them, say to Joseph, you don't have to go with them, you know, because they are your slaves. They're serving you. They're working for you. You stay here. He probably got one or two servants to be fanning him in his coat of many colors. That is because their timing was off. If they had known that the fulfillment of that promise was still about 17 years away, 
they would have taken the coat of many colors. They wouldn't have bothered with it. They would have sent him to go and do the work also because it wasn't yet his time to reign. But because the timing was off, frustration setting, jealousy setting, all kinds of... Do you know that his brothers were not mad when they got to Egypt eventually and found out that their brother was the prime minister? They were not mad. They were not jealous anymore because when the time for it came, the Bible says God makes everything beautiful in its time. So the reason why some people are jealous of what God has given to you is because they do not recognize that it is for their sake that God gave that to you. It is for your sake. You see, because the Bible says that God has given to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And when it pertains to life and godliness, none of that is supposed to be consumed on the self because godliness means to give. For God so loved the world that he gave. And so everything that God has given to me, he has given to me for the edification of the body and the perfecting of the saints. And if you are one of the members of the body of Christ and one of his saints, you should be delighted at the extent of my gifting rather than being jealous of my calling. But because we do not know. Let me tell you something. Recently, we had, a, we had about two families that were noticeably jealous of us because of certain things that our children were doing. And, and they were like, well, why is it that it's just their children that are doing this and doing that? Do you know that if God would give them, or if they would allow themselves to see into the future and see exactly the reason why these children are the way they are today and what they could potentially benefit from in the future, guess what? They would celebrate and also ask, how can we be praying for your children? You see what I mean? Because if those guys had known that Joseph was the way he was for the reason of saving the generation when the time comes, they wouldn't have sold him into slavery, if anything at all. They would have been fanning him even when he was 13 because they're like, one day, this dude right here that doesn't want to get his hand dirty, he's going to save the world. You see, it's all about timing. We just need to know our timing and our seasons. You see, one of the most dangerous things that can happen to anybody is for them to miss their visitation. If God says to you, Kanida, I am coming to your house at 2 p.m. on Monday. You know, from 2 p.m. on Saturday, you will not go anywhere. Okay, from Friday. Yeah, because you wouldn't want to get stuck in traffic. You wouldn't want to go out and fall down and not be able to receive God when it comes. You will, pre you will do a test preparation of the meal of what God likes. You will cook it and recook it and get your neighbors to come and sample it. Well, do you like it? Because you were made in his image and likeness. So if you like it, most likely he will like it. You know, you will be doing all of those things ahead of Monday. But what if the Monday that God is talking about is in 2025? But you thought it was Monday, November 7th. And so you cook and then you wait and God didn't show up. And you're like, okay, yeah, you know, sometimes God can be busy, you know. He's the God of all flesh, the Father of all spirit. Everyone is trying to get his attention. But if he said it, he will do it, right? Why is he not here? 2 p.m. is not showing up. You're like, ah, oh, God lives in the mountains. So maybe it's 2 p.m. is mountain time. So he's going to show up at 4 p.m. You understand what I mean? And then 4 p.m. comes and it doesn't show up and you're like, mm, okay, it's all right. I understand. If he hasn't shown up, maybe we'll just give him another benefit of the doubt. Simply because when he planted the garden east of Eden, he's probably coming from the west. So you give him, what, Pacific time. You wait until 5 o'clock to see if he will show up. And if he doesn't show up at 5, then you begin to doubt the word of God. And when God told you, God was probably speaking from 2025. But a lot of us, the reason why we are stuck where we are, I keep saying this, I know like now I'm sounding like a broken record because I keep saying this thing again and again. Do, do you know what I mean when I say I'm sounding like a broken record? You know, back in the day of the LPs, the turntable, if it's broken, the needle can't go past so he keeps repeating the same track. You see what I mean? Isaac probably wouldn't know that because turntables were before your time. Just a little bit, okay, yeah. But I'm sounding like I'm repeating myself, but it is needed. Many of us are not on God's time simply because of unforgiveness. Because we are holding on to the past. Many of us are not on God's time because of what? Because of anger. Because of frustration. You see, because quite often, I heard a man say this, that those people who are angry all the time are living in the past. Yeah. 
And the people who are anxious all the time are living in the future. But God's salvation is applicable now. The Bible says now faith is. The Bible says today salvation comes. And so if you are still holding on to the failure of the past, the disappointment of the past, your clock is stuck. And that is the reason why you think God is still in 1987. But he is not. And that's because the person that abused you in 1987 is still being held in your heart. And your hands are not longer than what they are. If you're holding on to something in 1987, I guarantee you, you are still in 1987. It's not like you can be in 2022 and be reaching that far back. No, you are where your hand is. The Bible says where a man's treasure is, there his heart will be also. If you are standing, watch over offenses. Offenses have become a treasure to you. You know, when we have precious things, what do we do? We stand watch over them. So that which you're standing watch over, you're making sure that that person doesn't get away with it. You're standing watch over offense. You are treasuring things that you should allow the wind of time to blow into oblivion. So today the Lord is recalibrating our timing so that we can be on the same page. Alrighty. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you because now it is done. Um, in fact, literally the Lord showed me the minute that it will be done before I left home, but I didn't know what that time was. He just told me to pay attention to that time. And now I looked on the clock and it says it's 8.23. So I thank God because he's gone ahead of us to make these things happen. Let me tell you something, folks. God, the one who made heaven and earth, he made you so that he can fellowship with you. And so do not think that there is a level of closeness to God that is too much. You understand what I mean? If you see somebody demonstrating closeness to God, demonstrating friendship with God, don't you say, ah, hers is too much. His is too much. He cannot say two words without saying, oh, the Lord said this to me. She cannot say three things without saying, oh, when I was speaking and the Holy Spirit said this to me. That is the way every one of us should be. Jesus did the same thing. He says the words that I speak are the ones that I hear my father say. Jesus wasn't going around saying things of his own because he was always in fellowship with the father. And do you know that all of Jesus coming to die for you and me, all of the Holy Spirit coming into the world, all of those things happen so that God can be, you and God can be in fellowship again? Because you know, God came with such an expectation to fellowship with Adam and Eve because the Bible says that in the cool of the day, God will come and have fellowship with man in the Garden of Eden. And he came and guess what? Man had fallen. He had gotten trapped because of sin away from the presence of God. And so when God came, God did not find him. And since then, God's been looking for his friend. Every time. And so you see people in the Bible that God really paid attention to were people who took God as a friend. God called Abraham his friend. He says, oh, my friend Abraham. Imagine how excited God is whenever he's going to meet with Abraham. When he found Moses, he wouldn't let him go. There was one time Moses was asked by God. God sent an angel to Moses and says, hey, you tell Moses that we're up there in the mountains. He just needs to come and receive these tablets of stone. The tablets of stone were already there because God instructed that angel. He says, look, we're going to write all of these things. You should write all of these things down. And then when Moses come, you will give it to him. And then his responsibility is to write it in a summary. And so everything was already said. Why would any of that take 40 days and 40 nights? Because God was just not letting go of Moses. It doesn't take 40 days and 40 nights to tell somebody 10 bullet points. If you hired a consultant who took 40 days and 40 nights just to give you 10 bullet points, I'm sure you're not going to be happy. Yeah, even though sometimes a lot of those volume of work that consultants deliver, the piles and piles of report, when you look into it, what's important there is probably no more than 10 bullet points. When I was in consulting, we used to call it shelfware. Because you go to places and they want to fill their shelves with your report. So you go ahead and you write. But a lot of that is just padding and packaging and all what not. But the Ten Commandments did not have any of those. It was just ten things. But 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord was there. 
with Moses, having a great time because he wants to have that friendship relationship with you. Look at what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. The Bible says, and look at the trick of the enemy. The devil got us for, set for decades, maybe even centuries, trivializing what was most important to God. After every service, it became a religious thing to say, oh, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. We, it became so casual that we don't even think about it anymore. Whereas that was the reason why Jesus came. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. What God is saying is, look, I brought you the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to restore your heart to my love and my love into your heart so that this fellowship will not be like that of Adam that was cut short so that it can be forever. God is saying this time around, I'm not gonna lose you all anymore. That is what is most important to God. What is the end of prophecy? The last prophecy, what is it? That the Lord Jesus will come into that new Jerusalem and dwell with us forever. That is the last prophecy, that he is coming. Nobody knows anything else that will happen after that. The Bible says, and the saints shall be the pillars in the midst of the temple that is in the midst of the new Jerusalem. And there will be no sun, no moon, or no stars because Jesus himself will be the light in the midst of her. And that is it all over. Can somebody tell me if they have found a prophecy of something that would happen beyond that point? No, there isn't. Nobody knows what happens after that because the reality of it is God finally get, gets what he wants. So every one of us, we should strive to have that relationship with the Holy Spirit. You know, I keep telling you that the secret to hearing from God is not asking God to speak more frequently or to ask him to speak louder. The secret is really you paying attention and shutting down the noise so that you can hear him more quickly. But I want you to desire it. My wife got born again because she heard me preach. I like to say that very boastfully. The, David says, my soul shall make a boast in the Lord. The humble will hear of it and be glad. Oh, yes. You know, because I've been trying to ask her out. I had performed all kinds of gymnastics, but she wasn't paying attention. But one day, I was traveling for work. I was a traveling engineer for the government. And I was all over the place. And they, were, they paid me every night I stay in a hotel. And I was looking at my watch. I was on, on a particular site. And I was like, okay, um, this site is not too far from where I'm going tomorrow. So instead of going all the way to Ellsbury, I'm just going to stay here by the sea and just cross to the other bay. And the Holy Spirit said to me, he said, I didn't bring you here to spend time away from your brothers and sisters. He says, you need to go home tonight. So I told the pastor of the church, I said, I'm coming tonight. And he was like, wow, you're preaching then. I'm like, wow, okay, that sounds good. Thank you for the long notice, appreciate it, you know. So I showed up that night, and that was the night that my wife got born again. She had been coming to church, just very religiously because, you know, she lived in a town where she didn't know anybody, so out of boredom, she would show up, yeah? It's okay, I can say that, right? Yeah. Because now you're saved, feel spirit-filled, tongue-talking, God is good. <laughs> and what happened was, if you haven't heard the story, she heard me the way that I was talking just like now, talking about my relationship with the Lord, and she went home, and she shut the door in her little room in the hostel where she was singing. And she said, God, if you are as real as that brother Moses makes you out to be, he actually says he talks to you and you talk to him, show yourself. And the power of the Lord fell into the room that she was in. Minutes later, she was begging the Lord to leave because the power was too much. One day I let her share her own testimony because I'm a notorious testimony sharer. I like to share other people's testimonies. But then at the end of the day, what I'm bringing out of that is this. Let us desire it. And that's, look, my wife now will come and tell me stuff that the Lord's been trying to tell me that I'm not even paying attention to. The first time it happened, I was a little bit kind of like, God, is this what we're doing now? I thought you and I were cool. <laughs> yeah, you've heard me tell the story. I was, I was a little dumbfounded. I was a little shocked, nearly jealous. I was like, God, now you're sending Rosemary to me? You could have told me and I was like, I've been trying. But your analytical mind is not letting you receive with simplicity what I am saying. 
Because in reality, to be honest, the word of God is meant to be received with simplicity. The Bible says that the, the entrance of God's word brings light and it brings understanding to the simple, not to the professor at heart. In your delivery, you can be a professor. In your delivery, you can be a scientist. You can be an engineer. You can be a consultant. You can be very vast in your delivery. But in your reception, you have to remain simple as a little child. You have to lay aside all of your intellect. When you're dealing with God, he doesn't need your brain. The body needs your brain, not your spirit. You need to put that brain aside and let him speak directly to your heart. But because I was, I was in the middle of very important quote-unquote projects for some Fortune 100 companies, my brain was fired up all the time. And God was speaking to me, but I was no longer able to hear it simply because the light of God's word is looking for those who are of a simple heart, who are willing to just say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And so, again, when the Lord started to speak through my wife, that was the reason. The very primary reason was because there were things that he was trying to get across to me, but I was too full of myself. The Bible says receive the implanted word of God with meekness because it is able to save your soul. With meekness, meekness. I told you the word meekness is the word that represents taming, taming a wild horse. That's where the word meekness came from. And so we need to tame that wild horse, which is our mind. Our brains are like a wild animal that is always doing things for self-preservation. God is looking for hearts that are contrite and fully dependent on God. Do you know your brain doesn't want to have to depend on anybody else because your brain trusts nobody? That is the reason why if I stood here now and Alan was standing behind me, let me not even use Alan as an example because he's a big man. He can probably carry my way. Let's say Josephine was standing behind me and she says, oh, pastor, don't worry, I got you. I'll be like, oh, no, thank you. I'll use the stairs. <laughs> you see, because my brain is telling me, look at her size. Look at your head. She can't even hold. You see what I mean? And so I'm not going to just do this and, and, and cast my weight behind because that's what my brain does. Your brain is built for self-preservation because that is the animal in you. Anyway, let's not get into that. But let's come back to the issue of loving God and being in close proximity with him. Seek it, desire it. David says, one thing have I desired and that will I seek after, that I may behold the beauty, the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. You know the word inquire means to actually not tell myself that I know anything that I need to know. You see, because I don't have to make an, in an inquiry if I already know. He says, so I'm going to go into the presence of God. That's what I desire, to show up there as a blank slate all the time and behold the beauty of the Lord and to be there like a clean slate inquiring in the temple of the Lord. That is where we all need to be, seeking his presence all the time. So don't forget your heart needs to be in sync with God's time. And how do you sync up yourself with the time of God? By not allowing yourself to be jammed in the past and not allow yourself to be accelerated into the future. When I was in school, in elementary school, like the last year of elementary school, my mom decided to get me an alarm clock because I was that one child that never woke up on his own. Every day at our house, there needs to be a resurrection. My mom would say, you sleep as though you are dead. Because it could rain, it could thunder, it could, anything could happen. I never wake up. No. The only time that I woke up on my own in the middle of the night was because armed robbers came to our house and I saw them first in the dream. Oh yeah, I was sleeping as I would normally sleep. I, I slept, my mom would say to me, when I wake up, when she finally wakes me up sometimes, she would be like, it rained last night in case anybody asks you. And the reason why she said that is because she said, I don't want anybody to think that you're a wizard of sort, wherein you're not in this world. So when, it, when they ask you what happened last night, just tell them that it rained. Because she knows that I have no recollection of it because I was so asleep. But the only time I woke up, I woke up because in the middle of my sleep, I found myself in the back of the house and I saw men with, um, I saw uh, like two or three men and they were masked. And they were trying to break into the house from the window of the bathroom. And I was looking at them and thinking to myself, are these people really serious about what they're doing? What they're doing is loud enough to wake even the neighbors. 
Why would they be doing that in the back of the house? And I moved closer in the dream and I saw that they actually gained entrance into the house. And that was when I woke up in reality. And when I woke up in reality, I got up to switch on the light and there was a man holding a weapon at me. I was like, okay, alrighty, the one time that I woke up, this is what I woke up to. And that was exactly what happened. They were smashing the wall so loud, but nobody woke up. Why? Because we found the openings in the window from different rooms where they had sprayed in a chemical to put us to sleep. So my mom, my mom wakes up. If, if, if your clock is ticking too loud, tick tock, tick tock, my mom would wake up because she was a light sleeper. But that morning we woke her up after we were sure that the armed robbers were gone, maybe about 7 a.m. in the morning, and we, we had to literally tap her to rouse her from sleep. Anyway, we can learn from that because this is the same strategy that the devil uses. He puts people to sleep. That's why Jesus kept saying, when you see these things, wake up. Wake up. Wake up from your sleep. He says the enemy will come with a carousing drink to put people to sleep when they are supposed to be praying. But in any way, in any case, let me finish saying what I was saying and then we'll go back to this issue of what my wife prayed about and the reason why she prayed and then we're going to wrap up the service. God is calling you and I to proximity. He wants us to be close to him. He wants our time to be correct. That alarm clock that my mom got for me was problematic because I will wind it too tight and when it's tight for the first couple of hours, it would speed up and gain 20 minutes, like every two hours. And so the alarm was in the future. Some of us were in the future because we're always worrying about tomorrow. Jesus says, take no thought for, take, take no thought for tomorrow. He says, live in the now. So I want to encourage you, you want to hear God better? Live in the now. Alrighty, so that's all of that. Now let's go back to what my wife was saying when she prayed. She said, this man of God's been telling us things about the future, about what God is doing upon the earth, but that it takes a heart of understanding and the wisdom of God to be able to know what he is saying to you in particular. Do you know that quite often, many of us are not particularly ob oblivious or ignorant of what God is doing we're just not sure of what we should be doing. We don't know what part we should play in it. You see, because the instructions of God are of two types. Mainly, there is the general information that is for everybody. And there is the specific instruction for you. You understand what I mean? And that is the reason why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom and in all you're getting, get understanding. Alrighty. So come with me to Isaiah chapter 33 and just put a bookmark there. In fact, before you go to Isaiah 33, let's quickly go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. So Genesis 3, 17, we're reading that as a recalibrator. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Genesis 3, 17, the Bible says, Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. God is not very, wasn't very happy right here. And what he was mad about was because Adam heeded the voice of his wife and did the opposite of what God said. Okay? Now let me say this. In the times that we're in, there is a lot that is being said, not just prophetically, but also in the world. The world has its own false prophets and teachers. Okay? You know the way the devil is going to bring his government to the earth that will be led by the Antichrist is through the ministry of false prophets and teachers. That's what the Bible says, that Satan will come and by the deceiving power or the power of deception that has been given to him, he will raise for himself two witnesses 
Because that's what Jesus does. Jesus has two witnesses. Remember? Revelations chapter 9, the Bible talks about, I mean, Revelations 11, Revelations 13, we read about the two witnesses that are coming into the world. And they would come and have the power to plague the earth and also the power to consume their enemies with fire and the power to hold the rain as well as the power to declare for the drought to end. Okay? Let me take a minute to just quickly explain a little bit of that if you want to go and study it further. You see, Satan does not have any tricks of his own. He doesn't have any methods. The Bible says there was nothing made that was made without the word. You look through scriptures, the people Satan tempted. He tempted them using the word of God. He just manipulated the word of God. Okay? So, if Satan can create anything of his own, he would not be bothering you. Jesus says the thief comes not but to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Why does the thief come to steal from you if he can just go and make his own? When Satan was kicked out of heaven, the Bible says his place was no more. And the angel of the Lord said, Woe unto the inhabitants of the earth because the accursed one is falling. They're like, oh, they're in trouble now because he has nothing of his own. He's going to come and bother the people that God has just given this beautiful planet to. He's going to come and bother them because he's looking to have something to his own name. And that is the reason why it comes after you. So we have every proof in God's word to let us know that Satan cannot create anything on his own. And so that is the reason why he himself relies on whatever God gives him. Satan is not capable of the deception that you're seeing in the world today. He's not that cunning. The Bible says that power was given to the dragon, even to the serpent of old, to deceive the nations such that even the elect are not immune. You see what I mean? And so, I tell you this. If you know the word of God, you will know the wiles of the enemy. The Bible says, be not ignorant of the devices of the crafty. And so because we know that Satan typically looks at whatever Jesus does and he does the same. So when Jesus raised two witnesses, one of them representing the church and the other representing the nation of Israel, carrying on the covenant that God had with Abraham, Satan was like, okay, I'm going to do the same. So what do we have in the world today? The elite, the elites, elite, uh, what do we call them? Uh, the elites of the world a lot of the people that own the, most of the land on earth and control pretty much all of the currencies are families that have been in existence for thousands of years, pretty much since the time of Abraham. And they've been handing over power to their children, handing over power to the children because Satan is like, this is what God does. He blessed Abraham and Abraham passed it on to Isaac, Isaac unto Jacob, Jacob the 12 tribes, even Ishmael, the blessing of God upon Ishmael, the son of the bond woman was only going to proliferate if he went through his 12 princes. And certain, Satan is like, okay, so that is one of the witnesses. It has to be a physical bloodline of vampires that I need to keep passing my deception down through. But then he looked again and Jesus came after a while and raised for himself from the other side of the river. Because you know the Bible says prophet Zechariah explained what John said when he says, I see two witnesses and they are the two golden limestands in the presence of God and the two olive trees. Zechariah talks about the fact that there is an olive tree that has always been in the presence of God. And one day God found himself a wild olive tree and he grafted it from the other side of the river and brought it to his presence. And that is the Gentile church. Right, And so Satan is also doing the same today, recruiting a people who are not connected to the bloodline of the vampires and empowering them to also be witnesses of his immorality. And so he has his own two witnesses and they are of the order of the prophets and the teachers, but they are the false prophets and the teachers and false teachers. Because when you look at the way God's been raising his witnesses, they are of that order the prophets and the teachers the prophets and the teachers the prophets and the teachers because the Lord says that he will send his prophets and teachers to equip his people and so the devil is also using the same thing to what to disable God's people so in these last days that we're in where we are flooded with information because the prophets of the Lord Jesus Christ and the teachers are prophesying and teaching and Satan's prophets are also doing the same 
So more than ever before, we need discernment, accurate discernment, so that we are able to filter out the lies and hold on to the truth. And that is the reason why from the beginning, God started to make it very clear that even the people that look dependable, the moment they say that which is not the word of God, don't be fooled. He gave Eve to Adam because Adam was not going to make it on his own. You look around at the men that are in this room, we know how useful, quote unquote, they can be without their wives. I don't want to use the word useless because it's not very holy. Right? God said it is not good for a man to be alone. And so let us make for a help. So the woman was there by God's ordination. But you don't follow or take direction from someone just because of ordination. You can only take directions and you should only because of the unction. If the person is not speaking by the Holy Spirit, let me tell you something. It's easy for you to know because you look into God's word. What does it say? Has God spoken like this in the past? Does God even say things like this? When the word of God says, war unto him who goes to Egypt for help, and you now have prophets out there that are teaching that we should depend on the system and believe the system over the word of God. Should we not already know who they are? When the word of God says, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves, and some people in the name of being teachers and prophets have come to say, oh, well, because you know there's a disease out there that is killing people, you should not go and have fellowship. Just stay on your own so that you can live. No, the Bible says he who loves his life will lose it, but he who loves not his life unto death will find it. We know the truth because it has to align with the word of God. A kingdom divided against itself will never stand. So I want to encourage you folks, Sharp on your discernment in the days that we're in. Adam listened to Eve because Eve was recommended by God. But that was only half of the story. Do you know that if you spend, a, if you spend money that is only one-sided, it is criminal? It is illegal to spend a coin that has only one side or to give a currency except for a check. And that is the reason why a check is only valid when you sign it on the other side. Are you aware of that? Oh yeah, because money in any form has to be two-sided. Even your credit card is never one-sided, it's two-sided. You have numbers on one side and you have more numbers on the other end. And you cannot validate a transaction without using both sides. Simply because money is only money when it is operating as a scale and a scale must have two sides. And so Adam went with only one side of the currency of truth in his life, Eve. He listened to what she said that she had experienced emotionally because it felt good to her. But she didn't bring to mind that which the Lord has said and Adam did not either. So one of the ways by which your discernment is going to be sharp in the times that we're in is to learn how to look for the currency of the truth. It has to be balanced. It has to be inspired and it has also to be instructed. So that is also on one side. Now let's go to, now before we go to this Isaiah, uh, let's, read, let's read verse 19 of this Genesis 3. Very interesting stuff. Because um, you see, God's been very transparent from the beginning, <laughs> pun intended, because the Bible says he's an invisible God. But the reality of it is, because we had never seen him before, we didn't know what he should look like. That's why we pass by him all the time. You understand what I mean? We always have our preconceptions of what the Lord, of what God should look like. But hardly does God ever look like what we think. The reason why we always think we know what God should look like is because we want to compare God today to what he looked like yesterday. And they're like, no, I don't do that. I don't wear the same shirt every day. I'm, I've moved on. It's a different season now. And so look at what verse 19 says. The Bible says, in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are and to dust you shall return. Let me tell you something. Whoever turns to dust will turn to dust. That was what Adam did. He turned to the woman instead of turning to God. You see, the devil was surrounded with people who claim to be the voice of God. You can receive their testimony as a witness. But the Bible says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter shall be established. Don't just take their word for it. Search scriptures. 
you know me, I don't just preach at people. I tell people, go and search for yourself what's in that word of God. Go and search the scriptures. Don't limit yourself to the 66 books that the Catholic fathers benevolently gave to us. There are more scriptures out there. Read scriptures that Paul read. Read scriptures that was read in the time of Jesus. Then they're back. They're available. You know me? I will tell you, I've had people walk out of me, of, 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 of service. I've had people bang the phone on me because they said I'm advocating for people to, to regard scriptures that are not the 66 books. I said, well, first of all, I'm married to a woman who was raised a Catholic. When my wife was a Catholic, they had 77 books in their own Bible. And I'm like, isn't this fraud? The same Catholic church that gave us 66 books, they were like, if you don't come to our meetings, you only have 66. But if you come, we have more. And then if you wait after service, the fathers have 84. And they have books that were recommended in the Bible. The Bible keeps recommending other books. I tell people every time, I said, if you read Joshua chapter 10, when Joshua was so excited, because of the victory that God gave to them over the enemy. They were losing that battle and the moment they started getting a little bit of the upper hand, if they had gone to bed that night, the enemy would re-strategize and take them out before morning. And so the Lord caused for the sun to stand still. And Joshua was really fired up. He was telling them, he said, have you not heard? He came to a battalion of people and he wanted to encourage them and psych them up for victory. He said, have you not heard of the things that the Lord did in the day that he gave victory to his people? He caused the sun to stand still over the plain of Gibeon and the moon was right there above the plains of Aijalon. And he was telling them, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't tell you all of that because I've got work to do. He said, but you will find the details of these things. Joshua chapter 10 verse 13 into 14. He says, you shall find the details of the things that the Lord did in the books of Yasha. And when we're growing up, you dare not say you want to go look for the book of Yasha. They will cast out demons out of you. You know me? Um, I'm so thankful to God for the Catholic Church, but then at the same time, I'm not going to stay where they put me. You understand what I mean? They've done their work. Well done to them. But I'm not going to stay because if you stay where man leaves you, you'll be left behind because even that man doesn't want to stay there. There are other books that were recommended. One day I was reading the book of Jude. This one nobody even told me. I was reading the book of Jude and Jude was quoting from the book of Enoch. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, this particular Enoch that I'm talking about, this was what Jude said. He said, it's not the Enoch that lives next door or one that said he was sent from God. He said, this is the seventh from Adam. He wanted them to be sure that this was the same Enoch that was born when Adam was about 600 years old. That was the same Enoch that was taken to heaven by God. He says, that same Enoch is the one that I'm talking about. He says, do you know that Enoch saw Jesus? It's in Jude. You can, that Jude is one of your 66 books that you hallow so much. It's in there. He says that seventh one from Adam, he said he saw the Lord Jesus coming in glory with thousand, thousand times with millions. You know, thousand by thousand is a million. So we're talking about the fact that millions of his saints were coming as he was riding into victory. He says he saw him. And I'm like, how did Jude know? Because he studied. Do you know that Paul was commending the Berean Christians? Other people, they just waited for Paul to write them an epistle and that was all they read. He said, no. He said, look at the Bereans. Be like them for whatever we bring to them by way of tuition. They went back home to search scriptures to see if those things are so. The reason, the reason why we have all of these things is because and someone is like, ah, I've heard these arguments every time. People are like, oh, if God wanted us to know, he would have made it available. I said, okay. That means you don't know God. Because the Bible says it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. And it is the glory of kings to search it out. God takes so much delight in playing treasure hunts. He likes to hide things. Why? Because he knows us that if we don't search for it, we don't appreciate it. If you don't search for it, we don't... I've been to your house and your husband does not have a collection of marble that he picks up from the side of the road, does he? Because he's everywhere. 
You know those gray marble stones when, you, when construction is going on, you see them all over the place? Some of them can be as big as this and nobody picks them up. But if you had a diamond that is that size, you wouldn't even tell me. I'm just going to see you spending money online. You see what I mean? And that's because of the rarity of that diamond. The value a thing has is directly proportional to its degree of perceived rarity. I'm not talking about true rarity. Diamonds are not as scarce as they make them to be. But a family decided about 300 years ago to make diamonds very scarce. And so that scarcity of diamonds is a perceived scarcity so that its value can continue to rise. Even you, you need to make yourself scarce. You're too, in too many conversations. And that is the reason why ain't nobody want to hear what you got to say. Because your word is a dime a dozen. But when you become, let me tell you something. If you study the life of Enoch, when I study the life of Enoch, I'm like, this is the reason why they didn't want us to know about this man. Because there's no way you will study the life of Enoch and then you remain a Christian that is not hungry and thirsting after God. His name means full devotion. That's what the name means, Enoch. The name Enoch means absolute devotion. He was absolutely devoted to God. Even though he was a king over millions of people, he would not allow the demand of the people to bring him out of the presence of God until God says, okay, you can take a break now. He got to the point where they were seeing him only once a year and there was order in the realm. And because he did not turn to dust, he did not turn to dust. <laughs> the Bible says man is dust and to dust he shall return. If you keep turning to people, to dust, you shall return. And that was, why the, that was the reason why Enoch was never buried. Because Enoch was so <laughs> devoted to the light that there was no way the dirt could hold him. Enoch walked with God, the Bible says, and he was not because God took him. He showed up one day in the presence of God and God was like, so really, seriously, though, what's the point of this, your kingship? You only see your people once a year. And he was like, but you never let me go. You're always giving me work to do. Do you know that Enoch was appointed roles in heaven? He was serving in the courts of heaven while he was still a king on the earth. It is too empowering such stories. And the order of the, I don't want to call their name today, but the elitist order, they don't want you to know these things because the moment you know these things, then they can no longer control you. Praise the Lord. Okay, lastly, and we're going to wrap up. The times that we're in, great things are happening. Okay, these are the times we're in. The Bible says that the men of the world will say there's a casting down, but you will say there's a lifting up. Everything in the world seems to be in a decline. My wife mentioned what's going on that has not been reported in the news. You see, Jesus says when you see these things, look up because your redemption is nigh. Satan knows that the moment you see what is really going on in the world, something in you will wake up and begin to pray. Something in you will wake up and begin to anticipate. And that is the reason why you are flooded with political news that is neither here nor there. Jesus never said, if you look at what people are doing, he says, observe what they are doing, but also look at what the earth itself is doing. The main focus of our observation in the last days is not the behavior of man. It's not who is trying to upstage somebody in an election. It's not who is trying to campaign for office. No, the main focus should be what the earth itself is doing because the earth is a more reliable source of information than the man with lying lips. You know? <laughs> you see? Ah, praskunti yaladi. The God trusts the earth with things more than human beings. Paul says, Paul plants, Apollo waters, but the Lord gives the increase. How does God bring the increase? Jesus told us, he says the ground all by itself produces fruit. Because God knows if you, if you do the right thing, the earth will give you the right thing. You just read it because Adam did the wrong thing the, the earth started to produce for him the wrong thing. The earth is very fair. You see what I mean? And so that is the reason why Jesus entrusted his announcements to the earth. He says, when you, started, when you start to see the earthquakes, 
the flood, the tempest, all of these things. He says, then you know your redemption is nigh. And that is the reason why they're not reporting in the news that 21 or so, 20 something country, I mean, states. Let me say this. I, never, I don't think I've shared this with you in recent times. One day the Lord said to me to go and look at the map of Africa. This was probably like 12 years ago, if not longer. I looked at the map of Africa. I said, turn it around. I turned it around. He says, this is the way I see it. Okay? Not the way it is on the, you know, on, the, on the demonic globe that they keep handing to us. That's nothing but a lie. He says, the way that I see it, because I'm the one that sits upon the circle of the earth. That's what the Bible says. He says, the way that I see it, this is the way Africa is pointing. And I'm like, actually, that is the reason why our compasses are always pointing to the north the way he does. He says, what does it look like? I said, it looks like a hand gone. He says, yes, it is a hand gone. He says, and what is at the trigger position? I said, Nigeria. He says, well, keep your eye on that country. He said, because I am going to trigger events in the world from the happenings in that country. And I've been keeping my eye on that country. And a lot of what is happening there today is about to happen everywhere else in the world. You see, the, Nigeria is literally sitting uh, in between the Sahara Desert and the Atlantic Ocean. But five, six hundred years ago, there was no Sahara Desert. National Geographic will not tell you that. But up until about 600 years ago, all of that region that was called a desert was a sea. It was called Mer. It was called in English is the Mediterranean Sea, right? It's not that little thing that they call the Red Sea or the Dead Sea or the Mediterranean Sea. It was the entire north belt of Africa was a sea, and it dried up at the word of the Lord. But guess what? All that water was waiting to return. Because how can you explain the flooding of a country? that is about the size of Russia. The true size of Africa is about the size of Russia. It's not that little thing that they show on the map that it looks like it's the same size as Alaska or Texas, right? It is humongous. If you don't believe me, just go online and search for true country sizes. There's a website that actually shows you the actual size of countries. A country that size is now about two thirds, almost 80% flooded. And Many people still think the world is business as usual. The currencies that we have come already. I wanted to say this, the Lord says, if you're gonna say it, just say it. The dollar is about to be shaken. The dollar is about to be shaken. And so ask the Lord what he would have you do. Okay, I've given you the general information. Now you need to receive your own personal instruction. If you cannot hear from God in these last days, I'm not worried about if you're broke or hungry. I am worried about if you're actually going to live because the Bible says men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So this is the test of survival. Can you hear God concerning what you must do about the world economy? Alrighty, but let's go back to the flood. Those who have an ear, let them hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. This nation, Nigeria, is getting flooded. What did the Lord say to us on Saturday? Anybody remembers? The word of the Lord came to us on Saturday that as it was in the east, so shall it be in the west. That the Lord is gathering his people and he's gathering them from the east to the west and from the north to the south. So the things that we're experiencing from the east, wherever you are in the world, whatever is happening east of your position is announcing what is going to happen in your position. It's just a question of time. How many people remember that from Saturday? Does anybody remember that from Saturday? If you do not remember that from Saturday, you need to go. My wife watched because she was at the women's conference retreat. She watched the message of Saturday thinking that she's seen it because I know that she was telling me that, yeah, I've watched it. And then her mom called her the next day and she was, and my wife's mom was talking about the things that I preached about on Saturday. And my wife was like, excuse me, ma'am, I'll call you back. She had to go listen to it again because she hadn't even gotten all of what was in there. She had to go back in there again. You understand what I mean? Brother Greg was telling me, he says, I've gone back to listen to the first 35 minutes and I have made about 35 notes, 35 bullet points. So I want to encourage you. Sometimes it's not like I want to preach a long sermon. I, I look comfortable preaching the long sermon, but 
when I get home, my wife gives me a hard time for not letting go of the microphone in time. She's like, do you know, you preached for one hour and 30 minutes today. People don't want to sit for that long. And I'm like, it's not me. I'm trying to get down, but the words just keep coming. So there's a reason why these messages are long. So that there's a, you, you can have sufficient information to work with in these last days. So go back and listen to it again because I said that and I told you that this is what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the churches. Let the West anticipate what's in the East and let the South anticipate what's going on in the North. There is war in the North. It's coming to the South. The, eye, the, the hand of steel has been seen in the North where in Northern nations did not allow their people to travel during the lockdown, whereas we were still like, oh, well, we can go to places, we just need to do a test, and sometimes we don't even need to do a test. Let me tell you something, the next time around, what you saw in the north is coming to the south. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. But this is where I'm going. If you look at what is happening in the nation Nigeria now, it is not reported in the news. We have seen those photos. We have seen those videos. We have heard the accounts of people whose neighbors have been wiped out. First hand accounts on Saturday, on Sunday or so, I was speaking to my parents and they were talking about the place where we used to go and play basketball. And they said that place, which is not far from where we lived, people there have lost their homes completely underwater. This thing is so real, but it's not been reported because the devil does not want you to know what time it is. The moment you are not synced up with God's time, you will not understand God's message. If you're not synced up with God's time, you will not act when you should act and your instructions, even though you're trying to be in obedience, will be inconsistent. So we need to know what time it is. And so, if the news here is not telling you, find out what is going on elsewhere in the world. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. And the ones that have already been shown to you, Pray about those things because when you pray about those things, the Lord will reveal more to you because prayer is a dialogue, is a conversation and God is saying, come and join the conversation. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Because I saw this about two days ago and I didn't tell anybody. I was somewhere in the spirit and I saw a big billboard and you know what he says? He says, prayer is a conversation. Join the conversation. We need to join the conversation. We need to join what the Lord is saying. And how do you join? You pray. That's why Jesus says, watch and pray. Anyway, lastly, end of 2021, what did I tell you? I said the elitist horde that was holding the world at ransom is about to be taken out by God. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, that when they say peace and safety, then their destruction will come like the pains of a woman about to give birth. And the moment they took that idol, from Mexico and took it to the abominable place in New York, which is the United Nations building. And I tell you the reason why in prophecy it was called the abominable place because it is called UN. The word UN is the word uh, is one in French. And one is what God says man should not be. In Genesis 11, the Bible says God speaking that if these people became one, there is nothing that they propose to do in their hearts that they will not do. The only time we're allowed to be one is in Christ. John 17, 17, Jesus says, Lord, make them one as we are one. If you are not one in God, then your oneness is against God. And that is the reason why every attempt by man to become one outside of God is called an abomination. But even though they took the idol to an abominable place, the Lord knew that the eyes of the world would be set on that event. And so what God had done was from the time they built that structure, he positioned his angels in front of the United Nations building, warning the saints when the time comes. When I preached that message, I showed you the pictures. Isaac, have you found those videos from way back? I think about a year ago when I was talking about the UN building and the scripture that the Lord has in front of that building. And I want us to look at that scripture today, break bread and pray and then commit ourselves to the Lord in that scripture or through that scripture. Isaiah 43, I mean 33 verse 6. Isaiah, I believe, 33 verse 6. This is the scripture that was there. So when they brought that image that had the skin of a leopard, 
the face of a lion, the wings of an eagle, and the claws. Just the way the Bible describes it in two separate prophecies. Guess what happened, at least that we know of. When they brought that image, the Lord says they will bring a gift from the queen of the south, a people tall and smooth of skin. He says, and they will bring it to a place as a gift unto the Lord. And we're like, like so at first I was like, but God, how is this a gift unto you? He said, because it helps for my children to know what time it is. He said they will bring it from a land that is divided by rivers. They brought it from the regions of Mexico that is divided by the Amazon. So we knew that that is the present that the Lord is talking about. And they will set it up in the abominable place and declare peace and safety. And the Bible says the end will come. And so as the end started, so when we came into January 2022 and war broke out in the Ukraine, I said, and you remember, that I told you that this is the beginning of the crumbling of the rule of the elite. The one world order that is the order of the Antichrist immediately started to crumble. It was only a couple of months after that they could no longer hold onto the world. You know, they had the world in a chokehold with that lockdown. They could no longer sustain the lockdown. They're in a pandemonium as we speak, but they are like a snake whose head is being cut off. They are rattling and gyrating and causing a lot of commotion. But this is what the Lord would have you know, that when, that, when those series of events happen, the Lord orchestrated it such that ahead of time, already we were not supposed to just look at what man was bringing, we needed to see what the Lord also had brought. When I saw the image of that idol as it was set up, the Lord said to me, he says, zoom in and show, let me show you what I already put there. Do you know that that same building that is the United Nations building, has an angel of the Lord standing in front of it, not in the spirit, not just in the spirit, in the physical. You can see that image. It's an image of the angel of the Lord blowing that trumpet, which is the end time trumpet, end time trumpet that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah chapter 12. I mean, sorry, Daniel, in Daniel chapter 12. That same trumpet that Michael is waiting for. Michael is waiting for a particular trumpet to sound. And that trumpet is drawn. The image of that trumpet is there. One of these days, we'll find that image again and show it to everybody. And this is the scripture that is written there on that United Nations building. And what does it say? Isaiah chapter 33 verse 6. It says, wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times and the strength of of your salvation. The fear of the Lord is treasure. <laughs> the elites wanted us to be afraid because where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. They wanted to match our hearts into hell by fear because the true fear is the fear of the Lord and it's a treasure. And the Lord is saying wisdom begins when you begin to fear the Lord. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. What is the meaning of the fear of the Lord? To begin to live with the consciousness of the power of God even in the face of difficulty. Particularly in the face of difficulty. But don't wait until trouble comes before you fear the Lord. Because you need to practice fearing the Lord before trouble comes. The Bible says your senses are sharpened by reason of use. One of the things that the Lord brought to my attention lately, I woke up on Monday, I told the men on the men's group, I woke up on Monday and I saw one of the ladies who used to be a member of our community here. She used to come to communion house. She wouldn't miss a meeting. She would come to all the meetings. I saw her and she had become really old and using a walking stick. And I went, I walked around her a little bit in the vision that I saw. I could literally smell her hair. That was how close I was to her in the trance that I was in. And I was like, what is going on here? And the Lord is saying, the Lord said to me, just wait. And she came to me and she was like, what is the Lord saying? And the Lord said to me, tell her that it's too late now because there's nothing she can do about what I have said. Let me tell you something, the instructions that God is giving out to you and I today is for us to act upon it. Look at what the Bible says. The Bible says here that wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of our times. Every time that is passing by is passing like a whirlwind. You need wisdom to be able to lay hold of what God is doing. And so the Lord said to me in that vision, he said, she came. She heard, but she allowed herself to be pointed in another direction by the daughters of Satan. She says, and now look at her. No strength, no vigor. 
Because let me tell you something, only those who wait on the Lord get renewed. If you don't wait on the Lord, you'll be wasted away by the passage of time. But in particular, what I want you to pay attention to in that vision is this. The Lord said the instructions that she was supposed to act on, she didn't act on it when she should. And now it's too late. Many people knocked the door of the ark, but it was too late. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Let me tell you something. I, I beseech you by the mercies of God. Pay attention to everything that God is saying about the times that we're in to the church and to you. Because it is by listening and being conscious of it that you will receive wisdom. And that wisdom shall be the stability of your time. I asked the Holy Spirit. I said to him when he showed that to me, I said, what is even the meaning of all of these? He said, because I'm about to shake the world. Everything will shake. But I'm not going to shake the world until I have prepared a place for my children to find refuge. That was why I showed them the secret to stability before I announced the shaking. The statue was there to announce the shaking, but the scripture has always been on that building. I don't even know when. It's always been on that building. And people pass by it all the time and they don't even pay attention. They don't even know. They just think, oh, it's another artwork. It is not an artwork. It is a God work. And so I want to encourage you folks, pay attention to what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Alan, give us the communion. Praise the Lord. And, um, wow, okay. Let's, wow, okay. You know what? Let's read it. It's going to do us good. Revelation chapter 9, verse 17. And it might be 17, verse 9, but let's first of all look at 9, 17. Um, actually, Revelation 17, verse 19. Nope, he's 19. Hold on one second. Um, I know it's the number 9, 1, and 7. Okay, so let's go to 17, verse 9. Oh, thank you, Alan. And as we break bread today, I want to encourage you, if you can stand, let us stand. Okay, it's 19 verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. Ha! Huh. Praise the Lord. The thing that I told us on Saturday, we don't have time for Alan to come and tell the story, but I'm going to tell you real quick. Alan had a dream, because I promised you, I said on Tuesday, we're going to talk about that. He had a dream, and in the dream, he saw Arnold Schwarzenegger in the dream. And um, remember again, what was he doing when you saw him in the dream? He was coming out of the belly of a snake. Okay, I remember the dream now. It comes, let them see that you're, you're a real human being and not artificial intelligence. Because some people yeah, are going to be watching online. So tell them what you saw Arnold coming out of. Arnold was coming out of a snake. And that was the same snake that had been trying to attack you? No, it was a snake that I stirred up to swallow him but he made his way out. Praise the Lord. He stirred up the snake and Arnold came out of the snake. Thank you, you can be seated. When he woke up, he called me and he told me that dream. And my response, I just started to laugh. And he was wondering, I said, you know why I'm laughing? I said, I woke up in the middle of the night about four in the morning. I couldn't sleep, partly because my wife was not home. You know, she was at the women's retreat. So I was just turning and tossing and just, you know, praying that she would just appear. You see what I mean? You know? Um, and then I woke up, and when I woke up, I knew that I had been somewhere, and there was an ongoing conversation. 
But the part of it that was mine, it was almost as if we had been in a meeting and everybody was going to go do their own stuff and they gave me an assignment. So I woke up with the consciousness of that assignment. And you know what the assignment was? The Lord said to me to go and look at the meaning of Schwarzenegger. This was the night into the morning before he told me his dream. And so, and the reason why I explained to you that it looked like I'd been in the meeting is because I believe that he was at that meeting and that was where he was shown what he saw. But my part of it was just to go and look up the meaning of the name because the Lord has called me in etymology. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go look up the name. So I gathered my resources and I started looking at the name Schwarzenegger. And when I saw the meaning of Schwarzenegger, the meaning Schwarzenegger is someone that is from Schwarzenegger. Schwarzenegger is an area, a, a town outside of, in the regions of Austria. And what it means, the word Schwarz means black. Right? And that's why you see people who speak broken um, Hebrew, I think it's called Yiddish. They would, they would call, you know, black people Schwarz. The word Schwarz is black. Right? And then the word Neg means a ridge. And so I looked at it, I was like, okay, Schwarz nigger, Schwarz means black. And interestingly, the last part of the name also means black to some people. I said, but that's not what the Lord is showing me. Because I know your mind would go there, because my mind went there too. But then it was like Schwarz and neg. And that neg means a ridge. I was like, so a black ridge, a ridge of blackness? I mean, whatever that is. I just left it and I went to bed. But when he told me that he stared up in the vision a white snake and out from within the white snake came Arnold Schwarzenegger. I said, the Lord speaks to you by showing you people. And you know, Alan will see people. And the reason why he sees those people is because God wants to call out a name to him. And this is what I said to him. I said, Alan, we have just seen the release of the beast that is coming from the abyss. The beast that is rising to the top of the ridge is coming from the place of blackness. The abyss is called darkness. When the word abyss was first introduced to us in scripture, it was literally the same word blackness. It was coming from a place where there is no light, a dark place. And so this, this muscle is coming from a dark place. Do you know that that was what? Was, that was maybe Sunday or so? As of today, I was on social media. Someone said they had sent me a message. I was looking. And one of the images that I kept seeing repeatedly on social media that had gone viral, at least in my feed, was the image of Poseidon, or Poseidon, the lord of the underworld, who was coming out of the sea, looking boisterous. And immediately I was like, that is Schwarzenegger. I tell you all of that to tell you this. If you have never prayed before, as a believer, you pray now. Simply because this is the greatest enemy of the church. The beast that is coming from the abyss is the only beast that was ever empowered to take out the Lord's witnesses. So this is where the battle gets real. The Bible says you will tread upon the snakes, upon the lions, upon the scorpions. But in the end, when the beast from the abyss comes, it's over. The beast from the abyss marks the end of our, of our witnessing. And so why am I saying that? It's a great thing because the Bible says rejoice. <laughs> the Bible says rejoice because that is your way out. The beast from the abyss is coming so that you can go to the ridge of the mountain. But he's coming from a dark place. But he's coming to elevate you so that you can get out of here to return victorious. Let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. So let us read this once again. The Bible says, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lord, of the Lamb has come. We are close. But I'm telling you, the shaking that is going on in the world is going to affect everyone that is not holding on to the wisdom of God. So as we break bread today, Ask for one thing. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. Ask for one thing and one thing alone. Ask for wisdom. And say, so, Lord, your word says, if any one of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives freely without reproach. God is not going to reproach you and say, huh, since I've been teaching you, now you're asking for wisdom. No, whenever, we, you can always ask for wisdom. 
You see, because that wisdom would allow for you to make up for lost time on those instructions that you have yet to act upon, even the instructions that you have yet to pay attention to. By the wisdom of God, you will be able to recalibrate the time of your heart clock so that you can be in sync with what the Lord is doing. By wisdom, you will wage war. By wisdom, your steps will be guided. By wisdom, you will have peace. By wisdom, you will know what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. You know, the Bible says that anyone who has a heart of wisdom, let him know the mysteries of what the Holy Spirit is saying concerning the beast that is called the Antichrist. So if you want to know what is really going on in the world, ask for wisdom. I am begging you, do not take this ask, asking for wisdom as yet another cliche. The man of God is wrapping up his message. He doesn't know what else to say. It's just like ask for wisdom. Oh yeah, don't I know that I already need wisdom? No, but I am telling you to ask. Alan is my witness. Today he shared with me a dream, another dream that he had. While he was telling me the dream, I was telling him the interpretation. We both got excited on the phone and the Holy Spirit interrupted our little celebration and he said, tell him, ask. Did I not tell you? He sent me a message like minutes afterwards. He says, it's just hitting me now that you have said to me, ask. Yes, the Lord says, ask in this season. So what are we asking for in this season? We're asking for wisdom. I want you to open your mouth and ask God for wisdom. And say, Lord, I need wisdom. Your wisdom. Your fear is a treasure. Let my heart be conscious of you. Lord, let me be self-aware and God conscious. Let me be aware of who I am and what I'm supposed to be doing by the instrument of your wisdom. But Lord, let more than anything else, let my heart be conscious of you. For the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're going to quickly put the bread into our mouths, but before we do, I want to lend you a scripture for the road. Matthew eleven seven. Matthew eleven seven, the Bible says, and I want you to pay attention to two things here very quickly. The Bible says, as they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What I want to bring out of there today, and the reason why I'm saying is a scripture for the road is because I want you to go and meditate on what Jesus asked them. He says, what did you go into the wilderness to see? Why did they even go into the wilderness? Cornelia. The Bible says that John was out there crying as a voice in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. So that means people knew that the kingdom was coming and they wanted to go and verify and get more information. So the people who did not even know, Jesus was not even bothering about them. He wasn't concerned. But he was talking about the ones who heard that the kingdom was coming and who did something about it. Jesus wanted them to be very sure of what they heard and what they saw. You and I are students of prophecy and we have heard that the kingdom is at hand, that the lamb, the marriage of the lamb of God is around the corner. But Jesus wanted them to have a personal revelation and to hold on to it. And so when you ask for wisdom, say, Lord, show me that which I must hold on to. I need my personal instruction to be made clear in the mighty name of Jesus. Let us eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him. Praise the Lord. All righty. So I'm just going to pray for folks very quickly. Within one minute, I want to pray for everybody that is standing here today. And I want to rebuke over each and every one of us any darkness that has brought fear and confusion. In this season, the reason why many of us will find ourselves confused at times is because there's a lot of commotion going on in the world. People are running helter-skelter. And if you have any ounce of discernment, you're picking up on it. And so even without you confused about what, you, what is around you, there, is thing, there are things going on in the world. And so as people are running, I see the chariots I see the stampede and as they're running and running and there's commotion everywhere, dust is being raised and the dust is forming a cloud that is blocking out the light of revelation. 
And so I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, your heart will not be under any cloud of confusion, that your heart will continue to be under an open heaven, receiving from God inspiration, instruction, clarity, and above all, peace. Every time your heart will be at peace in the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus says, in the world you have tribulations and trials, but in me you have peace. Lord, we thank you for your peace. We thank you for the wisdom and the knowledge that brings us peace. For your wisdom and knowledge is the, are the stability of our times. Father, we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, let me, let me just quickly tell you this. Um, Sheila, if they would fall, let them fall. And I will show you how to pick them back up again that they may know that I am with you. You know, sometimes we're too concerned about not letting things fall. But the Lord is saying, you know, some things just have to fall, first of all. And then I will show you how to pick it up again. So don't be too worried about what you can do. Anticipate what God is doing. That shall be revealed in the mighty name of Jesus. You know, and you have come to a season wherein you have to lay one down for the other. Okay? So you need to put one aside. I see it's almost like an unfinished book. You need to put one aside for the other. Simply because there is that much precision and focus and attentiveness that is needed to complete one before going to the other. And I'm going to say this for you very quickly, Brother Stefan. You see, I want you to hear very clearly what is being said. Okay? I see someone come to you, a woman. I know who it is, but I won't say. But you know. Hear everything she's saying first before you offer your opinion. You see, because the Lord wants to speak through you, but what she's coming with, you have a preconceived mindset. You know exactly what you would answer, but the Lord does not want your answer this time around. He wants you to be his mouthpiece. So do what? Listen completely until it's all said and verify that everything has been said. Let them ask you, are you still listening? You'll be like, oh, I'm listening. I want to be sure that you finish saying everything you're saying. And at that particular point in time, the Lord will speak through you. There will be brokenness. There will be brokenness in terms of humility of heart. But then after that, you will see the Lord lift up the humble in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Sister Michelle, I want you to come to my wife afterwards. Let her pray for you. The Lord is bringing upon you a new unction. But for that unction to be fully functional, you need to receive the favor of God. You see, certain people have to just want to be with you, want to serve you, want to work with you. They need to be attracted to you by the favor of God. Otherwise, there's nothing else that will hold them. Whatever it is that you can offer to keep them, somebody else can offer even more. So what you need is the favor of God to retain the ones that need to serve in the vineyard that God has put you. So just come, let her lay hands on you, let her pray for you so that there will be a release of that favor. That favor looks like a purple flower and it's going to stay fresh upon you. And you know what it does? It, it's a scent. It gives off, gives off a scent that will bring to you and they will just stay. No matter what you do, they just wouldn't be able to leave because the Lord is bringing them in this season and even in the one to come. In the mighty name of Jesus, let her lay hands on you and pray over you in Jesus' name. Now let me pray for the Samson's in the house. You come. Brother Greg, give the baby to somebody else and come. I'm going to pray for the Samson's in the house. Charles, you come too. I'm going to pray for you. And the reason why I'm saying that I am praying for the Samson's is this. You see, there are certain things that all three of you, representing the Samson's in the body of Christ, have been trying to do, you've been desirous of doing, but the Lord is not allowing you to do it simply because it will stain your garment. You see, you're a Nazarite. The Lord has consecrated you to himself. You see, oh, I want to get into this. I want to get into that. And the Lord is saying, no, you are Samson. You cannot get into what everybody's getting into for the preservation of strength. So Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you all to join your right hands, if you can, in the middle here. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. And this is what I'm going to pray for you all. You see, Brother Greg, I want you to step back a little bit. Make room. That's it. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. You see, in the season that we're in, there is a special grace that has been given to the angels that are doing the work of harvest in this last season. The work of the separation of the wheat from the tears is being done by the angels. You know, it started about 2020. I started telling you about the camp and the meetings of angels that I was privileged to, the different regiments of them that I was seeing. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit brought to my attention is they've been allowed to function without the things that they have always known. 
a lot of them had never been to the earth. You know, the Lord showed it to me. My brother from all the way from Nigeria confirmed it even without me telling him that there are angels on the earth now who had never been here. And so they are functioning in an environment wherein all of what they are used to or a lot of what they're used to may be missing, but they're still able to function. You see that particular grace to be able to function and to still deliver your payload without what you think you need to have is already on the earth. The angels are operating it. So let your hearts be synced with the schedule of these angels and their divine enablement. That in the mighty name of Jesus, there is nothing that you think you need that will stop you from doing what the Lord has asked you to do. You may see other people getting into it and you may want to get into it also, but the Lord is saying now, no, 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 you don't need all of that and you will still operate in my strength because you are my Samson. In the mighty name of Jesus. God bless you, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, God is good. Now there is somebody here, as soon as these men were going to their seat, you said in your heart, oh Lord, I wish I had a word from you today. I wish that was me. Who is that? As, yeah, come forth. As they were going to their seat, I just heard it. I heard it. I knew as a woman, it was a feminine voice saying, oh, I wish that was me. Oh, yes. Oh, no, no. Don't come with her this time around. Let somebody else stand behind her. Okay? You see? The, because the thing is, his signals are very strong. Okay? The way he sees things. So that's why I didn't want him to come close to you. You need to see what God is about to show you for yourself. When you sent me one of those messages, I said, is that diamond? And you were like, no, it's you. But you said, you know why? But I don't, I'm not sure you know the fullness of the reason why. This is the reason why I thought that was her. You see, what he sent to me is the kind of invitation that God is offering you in this season. But the reason why you're standing here is not because of what God wants to show you. You're standing here because of the things that you put before the Lord. Those things have been distracting you from functioning in the office of the seer that you are. Okay? So as important and as pressing as those things are that brought you before the Lord today, they are not as important as what God wants to show you. For you right now, those things do not exist. Those cares do not exist. Why? Because the Lord has a higher calling upon your life, an assignment for you. So the word of the Lord to you today is this, be at peace, rest your heart in the Lord. And then they will bring to you, you see what I'm singing is like a mobile office. They bring it to you and you will be able to function in the fullness of what God has placed over your life. You are a seer and you know what that means? You know when people hear that they're a seer, they're excited, they want to see. But what did I tell you about three weeks ago? If you're a seer, by default, you are an intercessor. You may not be excited about that, but you have to be of the order of them that wake up in the middle of the night to pray. You know that already. You've been dragging your feet. Time up. It's time to do it. You see what I mean? And the Lord said to me that by her kind, many who have become weak will be restored. The only hope that exists for the woman with the walking stick is intercessors like you who will revive them by spiritual blood transfusion in the mighty name of Jesus. Don't forget, those other things are pressing. Let another take care of them. You take care of God's business in Jesus' name. God bless you. Let's all be seated. Praise the Lord. God is good. I want you to pray. No, no, give this to uh, Kenyana. I want you to take this home and pray for your wife. Get two more and break bread with her. And once you break bread with her, tell her to wait until you have eaten the body and drunk the blood. And then while she's doing hers, declare healing over her. And tell her that affliction will not arise again. It doesn't matter how long it's been, this issue. You know what issue I'm talking about. It may have been on for all these years, like the woman who had that issue for 12 years in the Bible. But now this time around you say that now the virtue of the Lord is flowing through me and this affliction will not arise. You're tired of it, she's tired of it, and the Lord is saying do something about it today. Fix it in the name of the Lord. The Lord is calling you to do it. Why? Because he's already stretched out his hand. He's only asking you to witness to his power and you will see that miracle in your home in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. What I saw as I was leaving that place was a, was a vessel. It looks like a vase, a glass vase, and it was broken. And it was flowing, and everybody's feet could touch it. And the Lord said to me, tell everybody that is here, if there's anyone sick in their family, if there's anyone, even if it's you that is sick, 
pray for healing because that oil of healing that was released for their sake is also accessible to you by virtue of your obedience. Alrighty, so let's put afflictions out so we can focus on doing the work of witnessing in these last days. Alrighty, so the offering announcement is going to be on the screen. I want you to not stop praying for unbelievers, okay? I know that many of you have been hearing me say that we are in the season of the five wise virgins of not sharing their oil. Yeah, that is for those people who have had an opportunity but who have refused to pay attention. Don't let them belabor you. But for those who are still outside, there is room for some to come in. So pray for them. Pray for their salvation. And the Lord says when you pray for the salvation of those members of your household who are not saved, He says do not beg for their soul. He says declare the Lord's salvation over them and so shall it be in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Alrighty, I'm going to ask Kenyatta to come and pray over the offering. While it's coming up, prepare your offering and keep an eye out for the announcements. God bless you. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, Heavenly Father. We thank you for the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us, Heavenly Father. We come before you right now, Heavenly Father, with this offering, Lord God, asking that you would bless it, that you would multiply it, Heavenly Father, that every sin of it, Father God, would go towards doing your will in a mighty way, Heavenly Father, and showing your power and your presence in these times, Heavenly Father. We ask for these things under the sound of our weak voice in Jesus Christ's holy name. We say thank you and we say amen. amen. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Well, that we've come to the end. But I want to encourage us all tonight. We know there's a tangible presence of God here. So while the minstrels are here as you're preparing to leave, be encouraged to stay. Spend time in the atmosphere while the minstrels are playing. While this atmosphere is sweet, we know so much oil has gone forth. Let's press into it. Father, we give you praise. We thank you for this meeting. We thank you for what you have imparted unto us unto tonight, oh God. We thank you for your presence, for indeed you have come in this place. You have honored your word that says, where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of them. Father, we give you praise. All glory and honor belong to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. Everyone have a blessed night. Yes.